Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lee Markville, and I'm the Director of Special Sale and Business Development at Springer Publishing. For those of you who don't know Springer Publishing, we are an award-winning publisher of nursing and healthcare content featuring books, apps, journals, and digital products. Today, we are presenting PCOS Update 2023, Common, Complex, and More Serious Than Ever, presented by R. Mimi Secor and Amy Holland. Mimi Secor, DMP, FNP, BC, FAANP, is a, family, is a nurse practitioner, a national speaker educator, author, and consultant. She has worked for 40 years as a family nurse practitioner specializing in women's health. And Amy Chisholm Holland, DNP, WHNP, BC, FNPC, FAANP, FAAN, is globally recognized as a woman's health expert, nurse practitioner educator, leader, policy advocate, and author. Amy is currently professor and associate dean for graduate clinical education at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this webinar is being recorded. If you miss any portion of the presentation, you can find the, web the video on Springer Publishing's website five to seven days post-event. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel, and I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. If you forget to ask a question, there'll be a brief survey sent at the end of the webinar, and you can include your question there. In addition, our authors have generously provided their contact information, emails, at the end of the presentation, so keep an eye out for that as well. So now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Mimi and Amy. Thank you very much, Lee. It's uh, my great honor and pleasure to be here with Dr. Amy Holland, and we're so grateful for Springer to be uh, helping us with this webinar, and we're thrilled to have you all here. So Dr. Holland and I are both very excited about this topic. It's of great interest to both of us, and we're thrilled to have it in our new textbook that we co-edited together. Um, Dr. Holland, thank you for it being such a great pleasure to work with you on that incredible project. And now it's hot off the press. How exciting. So you have plan B for a reason. So we are talking today about, I think we're on show mode here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, when we think about polycystic ovary syndrome, better known as PCOS, it's interesting that it um, it's the most common reproductive endocrine condition. We see it a lot clinically, whether we're in primary care, women's health, in uh, endocrine practices, we just see it a lot. And we know that it's associated with androgen excess related to the ovaries and the adrenal gland. Uh, it's the most common cause of female subfertility, infertility. And amazingly, we still haven't figured out the exact cause. In fact, it appears to be multifactorial. And so that's fascinating to me. And it should be to you as well. We know there is a genetic component we also know that obesity, which is on the rise, persons with obesity are on the increase, is an independent risk factor, probably because it's associated with insulin resistance, which we'll talk about shortly. But you name it, and it seems like everything could potentially be a factor related to the pathogenesis of this. So we're even looking at in utero exposure to things like um, environmental uh, factors, uh, pesticides, herbicides, PBAs, um, air pollution. We definitely know there's a component with most of our patients that have PCOS, I'm not saying all, but most, related to insulin resistance. Um, stress. Certainly none of us have any stress in our lives, right? But stress also is being looked at. And even the gut microbiome, it has been found that as testosterone levels go up, the diversity, the gut microbiome actually becomes less, less diverse. So I find that one of the most fascinating areas of research right now. So just know that multifactorial is probably very common. The pathophysiology, we have finally really begun to understand more than when I started my career. We just thought it was cysts on the ovaries, and we really just didn't understand it. 
We called it Stein-Leventhal syndrome way back when. So what we do know is that the increased insulin levels and the increased androgen levels really disrupt the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access and cause a problem with ovulation. They end up with slightly elevated tonic levels of hormones. As a result, decreased follicular maturation, decreased sex hormone binding globule, which we see often that's associated with decreased libido, uh, specifically with our uh, combined oral contraceptives, because it drives up that testosterone level. Um, So the features of PCOS that are very common, most common ones, anovulation, which means irregular menstrual cycles, um, sometimes almost to the point of amenorrhea where you don't have a menstrual cycle. Uh, sometimes you hear that referred to as abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, overproduction of androgenic hormones. We know androgen um, is associated with acne, ursitism, and uh, baldness as well. You see sometimes the thinning in the hair, the baldness. Insulin resistance is very common with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And last but not least, which can be unpredictable and also confusing, is that string of pearls on the ultrasound, which you were mentioning earlier, Mimi. What else would you add to that? Right. And and the, yeah, that issue is that you have this constant stimulation of the ovaries, so you develop these cysts, but you don't have production of ovulation. So that string of pearls develops. It doesn't develop right away in adolescence. It takes a, a number of years. That's why there's uh, really controversy over when to get an ultrasound and recommended not to check an ultrasound in teenagers at this point um, because it's just unreliable. And we know some women without PCOS will have cysts on their ovaries. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, the Rotterdam criteria, which most of us use that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, does, you know, have us look at the ultrasound. But the other two methods that are commonly used don't so because it's bleeding it's 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 a challenge does it yeah exactly don't have pcos if you don't have the string of pearls some people think so some people think not and especially in teen years it's unreliable yeah. so that's the next slide right the diagnosis so the next slide is actually the overview the symptoms and risk factors oh right right which we've covered a little bit but let's let's jump in and just keep the discussion going so Oligomenorrhea, highly predictive with the menstrual irregularity, pretty common. Yeah. Androgenism with the hypersitism, the hair uh, growth in places that normally don't develop in females. It may be around the breast, it may be on the face, the chin, uh, also abdomen. You may have really, really coarse leg hairs, uh, excessive uh, mons pubis. Uh, formation as well. Obesity, very, very common. And I know maybe you and I are very passionate about obesity. We sure are. And the impacts of obesity. And uterine cancer, sometimes primary care clinicians don't really fully appreciate the risk of not ovulating every month, which is typical with a patient with PCOS. So what happens when you ovulate is you produce an egg out of this little sac we call a corpus luteum. And then that little sac produces progesterone, which helps balance the uterine lining so it doesn't overgrow. So if you don't ovulate every month, you can get that overgrowth in the uterine lining, which over time could lead to atypia or even cancer. So that's why we see a potential increased risk in patients that are not medically managed. We'll talk about that as we go through this discussion. Breast cancer, we know that's linked to obesity. It also appears to be linked to Even non-obese patients with PCOS, I'm not sure we have that fully figured out yet. Um, Infertility, we talked about that very early on. Cardiovascular disease, abnormal lipids, gestational diabetes, um, they're at greater risk for that. And we now know that it sets patients up later in life for cardiovascular and diabetes risk. Mental health problems, we thought those were just related to patients' reaction to these distressing symptoms. But now we know these patients are kind of wired to be more at risk for uh, a whole range of mental health problems. So you have to bring your best skills in terms of interacting with these patients uh, to your clinical interactions. Anything, Amy, that you'd like to add to this slide? 
No, I think you've covered it nicely. I just think uh, we need to remember that this condition is really a ticking time bomb for cardiometabolic problems and OBGYN problems. That's how my infertility friends describe it. Next slide. So we began to talk about the criteria for diagnosing PCOS, and this is changing a little bit. But the standard approach we utilize is making the diagnosis, it's a really a clinical diagnosis. However, we need to rule out uh, various conditions that can mimic polycystic ovary syndrome, and that's now part of really the definition for the diagnosis of PCOS. So we can't just turn a blind eye and just assume everybody with irregular cycles and hyperandrogenism with or without an ultrasound has PCOS. And as we talk more about the diagnostic testing, it'll become very clear to you why we need to be really careful to rule out um, certain other conditions. That's totally new. In my first few decades of practice, we just didn't worry much about those other entities because we really didn't, we just didn't know how potentially serious they were and we didn't think we had to check them in primary care. I think you're ahead of us in OBGYN, Dr. Holland. So I think your index of suspicion has always been higher. Next slide. You see things differently. You know, primary care sees things, and then OBGYN's women's health sees things. We see things differently through different lens. That's true, but I do encourage primary care to build that women's health lens because you're going to see so many women in your practice and so many women in your practice potentially with PCOS. So you kind of got to put those women's health rose-colored glasses on. Yes, indeed. And that's what you do with your career. Your Absolutely. Your family, but you specialize in women's, and I'm thankful. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holland. So we want to start with the basics when we're, when we're screening these patients. And one of the very important areas not to overlook is the risk of pregnancy. These patients often are risk takers. You can think just logically. Uh, if you're not ovulating every month, you might take a chance at having unprotected sex. And if you don't get pregnant, you might think, well, I'm not ovulating every month, so why not? I'll, I'll use this as a method of birth control. Irregular cycles. So we always want to make sure patients are not pregnant. And even when they say they haven't had unprotected sex, how many times, Amy, have you run into this clinically? You know, sheepishly at the end of the visit, they say, you know, when you asked me that question three times, well, I, I do have to tell you I have had unprotected sex. Isn't that how that rolls at the end of the visit? <laughs> Oftentimes I hear this, well, I can't get pregnant. And I'll say, how do you know? And they'll say, because I've never been able to. And I'll say, that's not foolproof. Exactly right. You might have just been real lucky over time. Yeah. <laughs> now, CBC is important, too, to consider because in recent research, we've found that anemia can be associated with PCOS and iron overload, both caused by different mechanisms. Inflammatory cytokines associated with PCOS, especially obesity-related PCOS, can interfere with absorption of iron in the gut. So that's kind of an interesting, um, you know, pathophysiologic phenomenon. And iron overload seems to be linked to insulin resistance and more likely to be seen with our patients that have higher body mass index, but not necessarily just exclusive to them. So we want to get a CBC and it's not expensive. Uh, TSH, very important, particularly to rule out hypothyroidism, which can be one of the major mimics of polycystic ovary syndrome, can actually cause cysts on the ovaries. And we've all seen patients with thyroid problems have irregular cycle. They don't usually have the hyperandrogenism symptoms as much, but still you can be thrown off. And that's why you really do want to get a TSH. You want to screen these patients for diabetes. And doesn't matter which test you use, whether it's fasting, random, hemoglobin A1C, those are your three options for screening a patient because they're high risk. Even teenagers can be high risk. And then if it's positive on the screening test, we're going to want to do an oral glucose tolerance test. And so just tuck that in your mental pocket. We don't tend to think too much about doing testosterone panels, but there are times when we want to consider it. And before we even think about those reasons, we need to remember that with PCOS, you can see a slight elevation, usually single digit, in free testosterone. If you're worried about, say a patient comes to you and says, see this hair on my chin and the acne on my forehead? This just developed in the past two months. And they're 19 years old. That's 
And that's rapidly virilizing hirsutism. Say that three times fast. It's almost impossible. And that's when you'd want to check a total testosterone to make sure they don't have a virulizing tumor. And in that case, the the results are going to be triple digit. So really, really abnormal. You agree with that approach on uh, evaluating testosterone, Dr. Nolan? And oftentimes, I mean, I'll have patients say, well, then what do I do with these levels? I don't really know what this means. And so I would say, get to know people who live around you who are specialists, the yes. gynecologist, the gynecologist, whoever it is that you're going to be referring to your patients, you're referring your patients to. If you're in a rural area, there's probably not a lot of in new phrenologists. Um, there may be not. There may not be a lot of gynecologists, but find out who, establish a relationship and see what, what panel, what labs do you want me to draw before they get to you? Exactly. Because you're not going to be managing those labs. You're going to be referring someone to manage those labs. Correct. So we always want to have collaborative relationships with everyone we're going to refer to and consult with. And it's just going to stretch your knowledge base and your expertise clinically as well. So thank you for that comment. Next slide. Now, when we get into the realm of additional slot, additional labs, uh, if you're in primary care, you're probably thinking, oh, man, if I'm thinking about some of these, I'm referring to endocrinology. Not bad. Not a bad idea. Uh, unless you have a subspecialty in endocrinology and primary care, it's probably going to cause you angst to deal with this. And I go teach with a lot of endocrinology NPs and PAs, and it can be challenging for them to figure these various conditions out that uh, figure out these various conditions that I'm going to touch on. But don't feel obligated to feel like you've got to, you know, know the ins and outs of all of these. You certainly are always going to want to think about a prolactin level. If you have patients that have uh, unexplained headaches and vision changes, uh, dizziness in particular, to make sure they don't have a prolactinoma. Uh, but you're not going to do that as a standard uh, test on your basic workup of all patients with PCOS. And remember, recent research has now linked slight elevations in prolactin to be part of the PCOS picture that we see, the syndrome that we see. That's relatively recent. DHEAS, you may find uh, elevations if they have adrenal dysfunction. Uh, but again, if you're thinking adrenal and you're thinking Cushing's and you're thinking about that weird condition, um, late onset, non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and you're starting to glaze over thinking about those conditions, totally okay to just refer straight to endocrinology. And it can be tough on them as well. But if you see a young person, a young teenager, and they uh, just don't seem classic for PCOS, uh, then you might need to think about late onset non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And that's where they're not producing enough cortisol so that in, in reaction to that, they have more androgens produced that creates the situation we see clinically that, may, that can mimic PCOS. You can actually not clinically differentiate the two. So when we get to lab testing, I'll point out what you're going to want to do to be able to rule it out. And it's unusual. 4% um, prevalence, it's unusual, but it is a possibility. Machine's panel. Cushing's syndrome, Cushing's disease can get exceedingly complex. Remember, Cushing's disease is at the uh, level of the pituitary. I always think D in the alphabet comes before S, as in Cushing's disease versus Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's syndrome is at the level of the adrenal down with the kidneys. So later in the alphabet, you'll never forget the two if you just remember the alphabet. So with both of those, you're going to end up needing to either do these three tests that are on the slide, which we'll talk more about under diagnostic testing, or refer to reproductive endocrinology. And in primary care, you probably do not have the time to, to be dealing with all of these uh, um, situations. So just know that when patients have Cushing's um, syndrome or Cushing's disease, they have elevations in cortisol. So hypercortisolemia is what we call that and don't usually have insulin resistance. So those are some of the ways that we can kind of differentiate these various entities. If you have a patient that hasn't started their period by age 16, and they don't have secondary sex characteristics, this isn't even on the slide, but they might have classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So in primary care, if you see a patient, they don't have secondary sex characteristics, they haven't started their periods by age 16, um, some resources say 15, they are perfect to refer to reproductive endocrinology. Do you agree with that, Dr. Holland? Absolutely. 
Yeah, because we're in the weeds here. This can get really, really complicated unless you spend a lot of time studying it and really specializing in the, in these entities. Don't worry in primary care about getting an ultrasound. If you're an OBGYN, you may or may not get an ultrasound depending upon the patient, depending upon the age of the patient. Uh, we tend to in women's health, OBGYN, get ultrasounds more than you do in primary care. But remember, you can make the diagnosis based on two out of three of the criteria. Irregular cycles, hyperangiogenism, with or without an ultrasound. So you can do just fine in primary care. Next slide. All right, so clinical intervention. What are the goals of management? And overall, the goals of management are going to be to promote health and well being because there are internal factors that individuals can control and there's factors that they can't. But you, as the provider, it's your goal to help them understand what they can't control and then help them control the things that they can't um, because they may need medication, they may need treatments. So first and foremost, I always look at the weight, the BMI. And like I said earlier with Mimi, obesity is a big deal. Obesity is dangerous, especially when it comes to anovulation, because it can lead to um, endometrial cancer. So adipose tissue, which are fat tissue, fat cells, uh, produce an estrogen. Some of you may know that, some of you may not. But that's why when you have an obese patient with irregular cycles, you want to stop and you want to think, okay, is this excess adipose tissue producing increased levels of estrogen that are leading to irregular menstrual cycles and ultimately unopposed estrogen exposure, which is very dangerous. Chronic anovulation observed commonly in individuals diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome is an example of this unopposed estrogen exposure that we're talking about that can lead to endometrial cancer. So it's it's a big deal and we need to address uh, in our patients who are overweight, obese, and morbidly obese, we need to address that. We owe that to our patients. It's uncomfortable, I, I do understand that, um, but we owe it to our patients because there are very important things that can be controlled um, that can help prevent ultimately endometrial cancer in our patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So weight management, number one, decrease cardiometabolic risk. M Mimi talked about that just a few minutes ago. We'll dive a little deeper in a few minutes. We want to help preserve fertility at all costs. If it is possible, we want to try to preserve fertility. That's very important to, to individuals and to couples. We want to treat acne and hirsutism. We want to manage anovulation. And we want to provide contraceptive treatment options that can help if that's if that's possible, which is not possible in all patients. Last but not least, we want to promote mental health and we want to screen for depression. I personally use the PHQ-2, but you can also use the PHQ-9. They're both free um, yep. online. Little tests you can use. Also, the GAD-7 for anxiety. Very important. Uh, and very detrimental to health as well. So we see an increase in depression and anxiety and also bipolar disorder in individuals with polycystic ovarian syndrome. One thing we do know from the literature, you can go to the next slide, please, is that individuals with bleeding disorders tend to have an increased risk for anxiety and depression, All right? So individuals with polycystic ovarian syndrome tend to have a bleeding disorder. And when I said bleeding, I'm talking about menstrual bleeding, all right? So pharmacotherapy. Uh, we talked just a few minutes ago about first-line treatment. First-line treatment in the literature is weight loss. Weight loss, that's the first-line treatment for individuals with polycystic ovarian syndrome who are overweight. Well, wait a minute, I thought you had to be overweight. No. No. No, that's not true. That's a myth. You'll have patients who are within normal BMI who have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so, but if they are overweight, first-line treatment, weight loss, okay? For pharmacotherapy first-line treatment, that's going to be for managing the irregular menses and the hyperandrogenism, the combination hormonal contraceptives, oral contraceptive pills, or the patch, or the ring. Well, wait, not everybody can take estrogen. You're absolutely right. So what, what's the next line of therapy based on? 
the, the, the literature. Well, that would be your progestin only treatments, whether it be the mini pill, progesterone only pill, whether it be the Depra shot, or whether it be IND or the contraceptive rod. Well, what about patients who can't take estrogen or progesterone? <laughs> they exist with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And in that case, um, then we have to be very, very creative and treat current symptoms, okay? Each patient is unique. Every patient is unique. Every treatment option for the for patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome, unique. It's complicated. It's very complicated. That's why working with a team, interprofessional uh, team, uh, is often necessary. It's not uncommon that I'll have to pick up the phone and call um, someone or to go across the hall and collaborate with someone regarding, what do you think about this treatment versus this treatment? Well, should I choose this pill or this pill? Um, it's complicated. And that's the answer. So you may have to try various things and you may have to try various combinations. But let's talk about what the literature says. First of all, the combination of hormonal contraceptives first line pharmacotherapy, right? After six months of combined hormonal contraceptives, if you don't see any changes, um, if you don't see the ultimate changes that you're looking for, you'll see some changes, but you might not see consistent irregular menses regulated. You may not see the hyperandrogenistic signs and symptoms resolved or resolving. Then you may have to add another layer of treatment at the same time. So, for example, if there's significant hirsutism, I have a combined oral contraceptive. I'm going to choose a combined oral contraceptive that has a, a decreased uh, androgenic progestin, okay? I usually start with a 20 microgram ethanol estradiol uh, combined pill, usually with either norethindrol, um, desogestrol, or drosperinone one of the lower androgenetic pills, which will help decrease those hirsutism signs and symptoms. All right, so then after, I, after I've got them on the pill and I still don't see hirsutism waning like I want, then I will move usually to spironolactone. I choose 100 milligrams BID, which is usually the most effective dose based on the literature, and that's what I've found in practice. Some people are don't get the response you want with spironolactone, so then I may switch to Vanica, which is a great option. It's a cream. It's a topical. You apply it BID. It's a little costly. Insurance may or may not cover it. Other things that you want to consider is with insulin resistance. We know that combined oral contraceptives do help, okay, with decreasing insulin resistance but not to the level that we're usually looking for, okay? So it may be that you end up having to add something that we might typically uh, prescribe for type 2 diabetes, such as metformin. Now, the literature is controversial. Like, it's conflicting with metformin. Uh, it's Clinical data shows that it may not be your first go-to. Um, I still use it based on the patient. I look at the patient um, mixed with the uh, black spot black box warning. So you want to make sure you're familiar with the black box warning. Look at the signs and symptoms that are associated that are commonly associated with metformin. If your patient struggles with these signs or symptoms, I wouldn't go with metformin, but metformin has been very successful as far as treating patients with polycystic ovarian patients with what you're trying to accomplish with the insulin resistance and also with ovulation. It's great to help with ovulation. I tell patients who take metformin, if you're trying to get pregnant, be ready because it could very well happen. But right. metformin is great for helping individuals ovulate. So 500 milligrams by mouth uh, daily. I then go up to BID and then progress up to TID. It has uh, really uh, strong GI side effects. So you want to progress and go up slowly but surely. But you want to ultimately try to get the patient up to TID if they can if they can manage it. I usually can I just add something there, Dr. Please Hall? jump in, yes. Just uh, remember that metformin is safe in pregnancy. So that that's really reassuring to those of us that worry about these things. 
whereas the GLP ones haven't been determined to be safe. So unless they're using an IUD, and then you're adding a GLP one, that that's safer. But not if they're missing pills here and there. No, absolutely. Thank you, Mimi. Yes, jump in. Um, also, there's the extended release, which has fewer, still has some GI side effects, but fewer GI side effects. I usually start out with 15 milligrams uh, at night, and usually at night tends to help with those uh, GI side effects. All right, so then there are other medications that you can use that are also safe in pregnancy. Um, Loraglutide, lorag 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 I had the hardest time saying That's it. That's our tough one, I'll tell you. Um, might be one that you want to use, commonly used for type 2 diabetes. There are other medications as well. Primary care providers at this level, you're probably going to have, you know, referred the patient and the endocrinologist or the GYN is going to be managing these things. But just so that you're familiar, when the patient comes back to you to continue managing their primary care, that's why we're covering these, these medications, these pharmacotherapy options. We also have abnormal lipids. You definitely want to be proactive with protecting the heart. Dr. Mimi and I are very, you know, very proactive about that and very passionate yes. about that as well. Uh, the statins are the pre preferred treatment option. Uh, Ectorvastatin, there's different ones that you can use, but statins typically your go, your primary go-to. So now I want to switch and go back um, to the managing your regular immense use and hyperandrogenism. All right. So for those individuals who can't take estrogen or progesterone, what do you do to try to initiate a period? If they're anovulatory, first thing you want to do is try to initiate a period. So you can give medroxyprogesterone acetate. You give, based on the literature, 5 to 10 milligrams, 10 to 14 days a month. I start out with 10 milligrams, 1 PO daily for 10 days to see if that will cause a withdrawal bleed or a period, a menstrual cycle. If it doesn't, then I go up to... 14 days and see if the 14 day treatment will help. You're morbidly obese. These patients, patients who have um, morbid obesity, those are the ones you're going to tend to have to go longer days, higher dose to get the withdrawal bleed. Usually 10 milligrams a day, 10 days, usually cause a withdrawal bleed. And then if you don't see a withdrawal bleed, you know, automatically just go ahead and refer to reproductive endocrinology because there's something else going on. That's yep. definitely outside the sphere of primary care. Okay. What else would you add to that, Mimi? Well, I would just say that that's when you're starting to get into the endocrine weeds, so to speak. And even endocrine's going to potentially have some challenges dealing with these patients, but it's a definite referral. Yes, definitely. All right. Next slide, please. So encouraging a healthy lifestyle. Can't say it enough. So important. So where do you start? Regardless of their weight. Most of the time, your patients with PCOS will be obese, but not always. Let me just say that again. And your patients, regardless if they are or are not at a healthy BMI, you want to encourage a healthy nutrition plan. In the literature, there's no one diet or eating plan that's primary superior to the others. But commonly, what we see in the literature, patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome are recommended to eat a lower carb diet which may be Mediterranean or the American Diabetic Association diet, the ADA diet, as we refer to it, right? Like I said, there's no specific diet that's superior with PCOS. Uh, the goal is weight loss if they're obese to try to stabilize their ovulation, all right? Daily activity, very, very helpful, um, whether that is exercise or if that's yoga, we just want them to have daily activity, moving if possible. It may be in a swimming pool, it may be aerobics, it may be weightlifting. That's individualized based on the individual patient and their uh, symptom profile along with their, their diagnoses. We talked about weight loss, adequate sleep. Sleep is essential. If you're a primary care provider, you know how essential sleep is to uh, health and well-being. Stress reduction, like Mimi said earlier, we all have stress. It's inevitable, uh, probably more so now post-COVID than ever. So stress reduction, whatever that may be, it may be journaling. It may be exercise, whatever that is, that's impor important to uh, encourage. It may be a counseling. 
Um, yep. Which leads me to the next thing, which is good mental health. Mental health can impact ovulation. If you've ever been in a car wreck or if you've ever had final exam week, um, I know with my patients in student health, uh, it's around those times that their periods go wacky, as we call it, because stress can impact ovulation, All right? So at an official diagnostic code, wacky periods. Wacky period. It should be. It really should. <laughs> That's the language that they get it. They know what I'm talking about when it's new. Exactly. Wacky period. Love so it. definitely important, like I said, to, to promote and encourage healthy lifestyles. And then the next slide, please. Remember what I said earlier. You're not going to be managing this patient by yourself. Usually you're going to refer to a specialist, and then they're going to come back to you with a treatment plan, and you're going to manage that in primary care. So it is good if you do start the primary uh, diagnosis panels, whatever that may be for your patient. If you start uh, contraceptive pills or whatever you start, you want to bring them back in three to six months. Usually if you're starting a new field, three months, because you want to check that blood pressure, in addition to making sure that the symptom profile aligns, and hopefully it's caused a withdrawal bleed, and hopefully it's helped with acne and the various persistism um, that the patient may or may not be experiencing. So then once you get the patient stabilized on the correct treatment plan for the individual, then every six to 12 months, and typically, I see patients, once we get them on the right treatment plan, every 12 months. One thing I commonly hear with patients is, oh, now I, I figured out what to do. I'll come off my pills, if, the, if pills is the treatment of choice, and hopefully my periods will be back to normal. Typically, that's not the case. So I really try to encourage patients, now that we've got your treatment plan figured out, we know what works for you to help prevent anovulation, to help prevent hirsutism, um, it's important that you continue that because there's a myth that, well, if I stop, then things will continue like they are. But usually they go back to how they were before you started seeing the healthcare provider. What would you add to that, Mimi? Um, I think follow-up has to be individualized. You know, just, uh, I don't think it's cookie cutter. You know, if you're really working intensively on lifestyle, you may want to see them back every month until you feel like they've really automated their new healthy habits, whatever it takes to really help patients take control of their own condition is really what I'm sure Dr. Holland and I are both are both advocating. There are no two patients that are alike with this condition. Absolutely. No. And the other piece of that mental health problem, more primary care providers are getting certified in psych mental health because we have such a shortage of psych prescribers. So you might really want to think about that is this is a patient population that really often needs a therapist. Because they can be very high anxiety and, and at great risk for depression and, and other health issues, even eating disorders. Absolutely, Mimi. And one other thing that piggybacks to what you just said that was very interesting, I was looking back through the literature this morning, and it said that individuals who have been, not been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome but know that something's wrong, know that something's different, tend to get frustrated because of the layers of evaluation and assessment that it takes to get a diagnosis for PCOS. And so oftentimes they throw up their hands and just quit going to the healthcare provider, whether it's a primary care or a specialist. And that's what we don't want. So definitely listening and making sure that your patient has a venue for counseling or for uh, psychiatry who, where they feel like they're being heard and their mental wellness as well as their physical well-being is also being addressed. So, yeah, that's hard these days, uh, Dr. Holland, because we're having to see patients so fast. And if you appear to be rushed, they're going to perceive the visit as being shorter. If you appear not to be rushed, if you just even have a few minutes with the patient, but you're very attentive to their needs, they perceive the visit as being longer. That's another reason why we need to walk our talk and be healthy role models so we can manage our own stress to be more effective therapeutically with our patients, especially these patients. Absolutely. Well, this concludes our review of PCOS. What questions do you all have? We have a few questions here. I know that um, I've been scrolling through them a little bit. Yeah. And this uh, is Lee. Oh, Lee. This is Lee. Go ahead and yes, ladies and 
And Amy, we have uh, we have a lot of questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can. However, any additional questions that remain, we'll share my colleague Gina and I will share with Dr. Holland and Dr. Secor after uh, after this webinar. But um, the first question was. Are women consistently informed, educated regarding these risks of birth control prior to being encouraged to use hormonal birth control? If so, are providers educating women regarding the need to address numerous other related factors, diet, activity, other medical issues, in order to not exacerbate PCOS? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. I uh, have a lot packed in that question, so unpacking it would be, is challenging. Uh, obviously, uh, patients should be comprehensively educated and counseled and health coached. Uh, I don't know to what extent this is happening ev during every single visit with every single clinician. We don't have access to that. All we can do is control ourselves in terms of what we do clinically and those of us that teach to try to encourage our clinicians coming along to be comprehensive in their approach with patients. So lifestyle should never be short rift to just prescribing medication, but when our visits get shorter and shorter and shorter, what gives? Usually the lifestyle and counseling um, has to give in order to clear out the waiting room so you don't have to stay at work until nine at night. So that, that's a challenging question. And I would just encourage all of us to just step up to the plate and do a little bit better job with, with what, how we are approaching our patients. Thank you. The next question was, what causes the decreased maturation of the follicle? Well, thanks for asking that question. So what happens in polycystic ovary syndrome is there's a malfunctioning of the pituitary hypothalamic ovarian access. And what ends up happening is with insulin resistance that drives up testosterone, and that causes a slight elevation in the female hormones, but they're kind of tonic. They're elevated, but they're flatlining. So that's kind of the best way to think about it. You have constant stimulation of the follicles, but not in the way that allows for ovulation to happen. So it's quite an orchestrated system that allows for our patients to actually ovulate. And that, uh, that synergy of all the various female hormones has to be in perfect, perfect synchrony for ovulation to happen. In PCOS, they're slightly elevated, but they're tonic, so ovulation can't happen. But we do have stimulation, which leads to the cysts in the ovaries on ultrasound, you may, may note, or even on exam. Thank you. Uh, the third question was, could you address PCOS and its effect on milk production in breastfeeding. So in general, Marie, it's not thought to be hugely impacting uh, PCOS on breast milk production. However, if patients are stressed because they have PCOS, remember we have a lot of mental health problems related to PCOS, that can affect breast milk production. Um, it's possible that, uh, I haven't read the re any research on this, but it seems possible to me that as we improve insulin resistance, that may help with milk production, although there's not much research out there because I would know about it if there was. So I think the best approach we can take to optimize breastfeeding in women with PCOS is to help them get their insulin resistance under control and make sure they have good mental health, they're sleeping as well as they can, and they're drinking lots of fluids, healthy fluids, lots of water. Remember, for a non-pregnant woman, a non-breastfeeding woman, we're all supposed to have eight, eight-ounce glasses of water a day. We, if you're breastfeeding, you really should be drinking at least that, if not some more. Speaking, speaking of drinking water, you should be drinking water while sure. you're on this webinar. Sure, sure. Um, and it's that's very helpful. We also, as many people attending here know, we also publish um, Dr. Hale's book on um, mother's uh, medication and mother's milk. So breastfeeding is very much a, a key topic for us here at Springer Publishing. That's awesome. Um, That's great. Thanks. The next, yeah, the next question was, can you speak to any new or emerging data around risk for uterine slash ovarian cancer in PCOS patients, specifically who require in, who required infertility treatments? Any train change in frequency for screenings to reduce risk for the PCOS patient? 
In terms of infertility risk, infertility treatments and increased risk for uterine cancer, uh, I don't believe that's hugely significant. I think the more significant factor is if patients have, if they're not medically managed to be able to counteract the effect of not ovulating every month. So if you, for example, medically manage a patient by prescribing combination of hormonal contraceptives, then the progestin is in the contraceptive balancing the uterine lining. If the patient utilizes a progestin-only intrauterine contraceptive, then the progestin is there to protect the uterine lining. So the most important thing is just dealing with don't allow patients with PCOS to go uh, months and months and months and years and years and years without medically managing that risk of uterine cancer. That's really the biggest, biggest message I can give you. The next question was, if you're a carrier for the recessive trait for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, can you still express the symptoms or even have congenital adrenal hyperplasia? So there are variations in the context of adrenal hyper, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, classic is when patients don't develop the secondary sex characteristics and don't start getting their menses. They need to be referred. Usually they're diagnosed early in their lives, but sometimes they come to us uh, prepubescent and haven't been diagnosed yet. Uh, patients that have non-classic late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia, they also can have a variety of presentations and a variety of situations with that with that condition. So the most important thing is to get a reproductive, an endocrinologist to co-manage these patients, to help you make the diagnosis if there's any concern. Uh, remember, these are patients that aren't going to have insulin resistance unless they happen to also be overweight. If they have, if they're a woman with obesity, then they might also have insulin resistance along with either classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia or non-classic. Uh, remember, non-classic comes on later than congenital classic adrenal hyperplasia. But again, in primary care, we are definitely in the weeds. You're going to want to co-manage these patients that you're worried about that may have some variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia with a reproductive endocrinologist, at the very least an endocrinologist, because they're going to have complexities in their reproductive health over time, potentially. But thanks for asking that million-dollar question. Sure. There was a, a relate or a, a question also about hyperplasia. How does chronic anovulation lead to endometrial hyperpla hyperplasia? I sure appreciate you asking that question. So every month that a woman normally ovulates, the little sac that produces the egg also produces progesterone, which helps balance the uterine lining, preventing the uterine lining from overgrowing from only estrogen dominant um, production. So when a patient ovulates, they have the balance of the estrogen and the progesterone from that little sac, the corpus luteum, to prevent thickening of the uterine lining. So the way that it works is if you don't ovulate every month, every month you don't ovulate, you can have thickening of the uterine lining. And over many years, that can contribute to uterine cancer. But the process goes, hyperplasia is another term for thickening in the uterine lining, usually related to infrequent ovulation and lack of medical management. And then that can go on to atypia where the cells start changing, and then that can go on to uterine cancer. And guess what? With very few clinical symptoms. That's what's scary. And that's why we really wanna know if we're seeing a new patient with polycystic ovary syndrome, have they been adequately medically managed over time? Because they could theoretically be in their 20s and have a risk for uterine cancer if say they were undocumented or didn't have health insurance since they were young teenagers and they haven't had regular ovulation for in excess of 10 years, they could be potentially at risk for uterine cancer even in their 20s. It's much more likely in women in their 40, over 40, over 50, over 60. Uh, but still, it's possible. That's why medical management is so important and getting a good history from the patient as to how they've been managed or not managed over time is so important. And uh, we had two questions about progestins. Uh, the first one was, what are the low androgen progestins? And the second question was, what about the use of, and I apologize for pronouncing this wrong, dros, 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 
which is now available as a progestin only or as a Yaz Yasmin. There is slight increase in, bl in of blood clots as compared to other progesterones. Right. Do you use this as a first line therapy. All right, so the first question I don't like. I, I would never be able to be a politician because I can't handle three questions at once. So the first question was? Oh, the low progestin. So, uh, so low the, what are the low androgen progestins? Yeah. yeah. All right, so those generally are norethindrone and norgestimate and drospirinone. But as was mentioned in the question, drospirinone, when you actually look at absolute risk, there is a doubling in the in, as an increased risk in uh, life-threatening events with the use of drospirinone-related progestins. Now, the risk is still very, very low when you look at the numbers. If you had to sign a consent form to drive your car on any highway in the world, you'd be scared because the risk is so much greater of death than the risk of death from taking and utilizing a drospirinone only, or just an only pill, or a combination of uh, birth control method with drospirinone in it. With that said, we're dealing with patients with PCOS that may be at greater cardiometabolic risk. And do you really want to put, you know, really uh, pose any increased risk to these patients? So I tend to avoid drospirinone. What we know is any progestin in any combination birth control pill. It's going to improve acne and abnormal hair growth by exactly the same mechanisms across all combination of hormonal contraceptives. So what do they do? They raise sex hormone binding globulin levels, driving down testosterone. That's how they improve acne, abnormal hair growth, and even male pattern molding. And that actually is also how they improve, though possibly modestly compared to actual diabetes medications, improve insulin resistance by driving down testosterone. That improves insulin resistance. So there's this vicious cycle. Insulin resistance raises production of testosterone. Testosterone, elevated testosterone, increases insulin resistance. So there are multiple ways we can get at this. When you give combination birth control pills, that raises sex hormone binding globulin levels, driving down testosterone. That's how uh, any combination hormonal contraceptive improves the symptoms that we see with PCOS. So it really doesn't much matter what progestin is you select because all the doses are low now. All the estrogen doses are low. All the progestin doses are low. So you're not going to be giving any high-dose birth control pill. They don't exist. They're all off the market. They were available when I was young. We all smoke cigarettes. We're all lucky to be alive today, <laughs> literally. So I hope I did justice to that. I Very think challenging did. question. Thank you. I, I think you did. And I, um, we... We did have a couple more questions, but since we're almost at the end of the hour, we will keep those and share those with Dr. Secor and Dr. Holland, and then uh, follow up with folks after uh, after the fact. Um, and love the I inquiry did... questions, though. It means that we have an unbelievably awesome group of attendees today. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And to that end, we've had almost every single person that's attended today is still with us now. So we're grateful for you staying for almost an hour today with us. Um, the slide you see now is some information about adopting or purchasing the book. If you have any questions about adopting, there's a link there. We will provide all these links and the code information also in an email to folks. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will we have recorded this webinar we will edit it and we will share it with folks within five to seven business days of today um in addition let me move to the last slide which has the thank you for attending but any additional questions you can reach us at marketing at springerpub.com and both mimi and amy have provided their contact information below Again, we are grateful for everybody to have taken the time out of the, your days today to spend it with us. And thank you to Mimi Secor and Amy Holland. The presentation was amazing. We're grateful for that. And we want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of the day and a wonderful week and happy spring. Thank you again, Mimi. Thank, thank you. you very much, Lee, Gina, Springer. Uh, thank you to all of you as attendees. And do I have 10 seconds to address bio sure. hormones? Yes. Please. Okay. Angela asked about bioidentical hormones. And I just want to warn you that the FDA does not control compounding pharmacies. 
and the states control them, and the states don't have the expertise of the FDA. So I would highly encourage you to be very, very careful with compounding hormones and refer you to the North American Menopause Society, better known as menopause.org, for all the information that can help guide you, including clinical guidelines on managing your postmenopausal women with uh, any hormonal con uh, considerations that you have. But I would be extremely careful. You're hanging by a thread if you are prescribing compounded bioidentical hormones and the patient has a, you know, any kind of major significant event, which is high risk anyway for postmenopausal women, and you're using a non-FDA approved medication. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. We really appreciate yeah. it. Take care.